Good morning, everyone. I'm Donna Prosser with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're here to bring you another COVID-19 update. Our speaker today, Dr. Ed Kelly from the World Health Organization. Oh, hello, Ed. Donna, for that. Be remiss if we didn't give you a little bit of an update about where things are. Um, and I guess, uh, especially given um, some of the foundation's uh, um, uh, core group coming from around the world, but also especially in the US, one thing to flag uh, is the, the large number still of cases, the biggest cases in the United States and, and Russia, um, the, uh, in terms of confirmed cases and also, uh, and also deaths. Um, you know, we are down in terms of the rate of increase, which was at a very high rate uh, uh, about a week and three weeks ago even, but um, still uh, moving at, at a high rate and still increasing. Uh, in, in a whole number of countries. Next slide, please. And you can see this on the, on the, the graph here. Um, it, uh, the back when we thought things were crazy uh, is the first part of that little orange when things were in, in China. Um, the number of cases is, is going up. It's uh, at a rate that's a bit slower than we had um, earlier uh, at the end of March, um, but still uh, rising. Deaths have fallen, and those are particularly because of uh, death rates falling in a number of European uh, countries, uh, but we'll come back to that. Next slide. Um, and I'll just go through the, the different regions. I won't spend so much time on them. I really encourage you to look at these because it's fascinating the different shape of the curve, the, and um, you can see very different um, it's not strictly speaking a case fatality rate, but if you can see the distance between the black line and the top of the, of the cases curve, it gives you some idea of the difference across the, the different regions. Um, concerns in Wipros is that things have moved into very big countries such as the uh, Philippines. And I would just flag um, briefly here this issue of solidarity and, and the issue on Singapore, which I'll come back to before we close. Next slide. And uh, you can see CR a very steep climb as it's moved into India, Indonesia, and Bangladesh um, in a big way. Next slide. Euro, you can see um, uh, everybody uh, I know who lives around where we are, particularly in Switzerland, which has had good results recently, and France, less good, but still better, much better than recently. It's very excited. My um, daughters are pleased, but there uh, is a very slow and cautious uh, um, process right now about considering about reopening and, and we can come to some of those in your questions and, and answers. Um, uh, that's not been the case with some um, nations and some states in the U.S. Um, uh, I guess um, without yeah, singling out any given uh, country or state, you have to, that has to be done by local officials. Bear, uh, I think we have to be cautious about the, the move forward on, on some of this. Next slide. Um, the, uh, the, this is the picture for EMRO with a rising set of cases was just on with the uh, regional office today, both with the regional director and the, and the deputy regional director. A lot of concern about um, big new cases uh, in Saudi Arabia, as well as in um, other parts of the, other parts of the uh, region. Um, but very interesting in terms of the death rates and flattening um, basically through that whole time. So very, it looks very different from what happened in Europe. Next slide. Uh, PAHO, which obviously is heavily influenced by what's happened in, in the U.S. Um, deaths just recently down um, in the U.S. But I would just say, if you could look back a couple weeks, we thought we were headed down on deaths um, and, it, uh, and cases and deaths, both of them jumped back up. Um, so I think uh, we should not expect that death rate to continue to fall necessarily. If you look up above uh, it with a big increase in, in cases um, that could come. Uh, next slide, please. And Afro, um, very different picture in terms of uh, we've got a lot of numbers are very are much, much lower. Um, you've got a very different case fatality rate, interestingly, very different age structure there but also very, very different capacity. We had a, an, a call with, anyway, it's a tiny, tiny um, microcosm of the continent, but Sao Tome and Principe, they basically had zero lab capacity. So they are, um, there was some 
WHO has managed as part of this big global supply chain operation, which was launched yesterday at a press event at the UN Palais here. Um, uh, we've managed to get uh, solidarity missions with supplies to all 52 of our uh, Afro countries, uh, which is a great thing, but and rapid diagnostic tests out there. Actually, some countries like Sao Tome and Principe, because of the limitations on lab capacity, are using these rapid diagnostic tests, um, actually not in line with WHO's, uh, with WHO's recommendations about those rapid diagnostic tests because there are not other capacities. So I think um, the health system capacity will be a big question mark uh, for Afro as, as we go forward. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a quick uh, view, um, and I'll come back before we break, uh, but a uh, great question by John about uh, Sweden's approach. Um, but uh, the overview of age and sex in the case reporting form, the CRF, that's our database here. Uh, again, I won't, I'll come to the conclusions on this um, just after this. So next slide. And you can see here, um, interestingly, the sort of um, the uh, age and sex uh, breakdown that we have here. Um, across the different age groups, um, uh, sort of relatively uh, equal um, in terms of the two. Uh, so it gives you the outbreak in different parts of the world, really, but uh, quite equal across the, across the two time periods. Next slide, please. So just you know, some conclusions. It's very rare to detect cases in children. Those of you who followed some of the news today about this um, uh, sort of uh, I mean, it's not a Kawasaki syndrome-like uh, scenario, but this um, uh, this sort of rapid deterioration of post-infection for some very, very small number of children. So that's something to, to flag, but generally um, very small cases in children and some uh, countries with um, uh, having a shift to the uh, oldest age uh, cohorts. Um, and uh, other countries with that have more of a pyramid-shaped population have disease shifted to slightly younger and, and middle ages. Um, so the age distribution isn't changing much in countries across the different uh, countries. Um, we see a few exceptions that I, I note there, um, but some of this we think could be also the way that we track cases and test. Uh, and then a slight uh, difference um, of severity and disease based on uh, gender as well. Um, and obviously we've talked about the age distribution in terms of the severity. Next slide, please. So just to spend a bit, uh, a moment on this issue of health systems and COVID. Um, you know, it's been a huge, huge uh, burden. It is for all of our regions, the number one concern right now is the impact on essential health services and the potential for uh, both regular uh, chronic care services to just be left aside as well as essential uh, sort of acute services um, to be done uh, and a big dilemma about balancing uh, the risks uh, associated with with keeping health services up and running and um, what you put uh, off till later. Next slide. So just um, we've given a bit of an update uh, on our work um, and again, I'll, I'll go, I'm going through it quickly just so we leave time for, for some questions since we've uh, left a, a shorter time period for this and uh, logged on late. But the, um, we have this health services and systems work within WHO's response. That is a core uh, piece of work that funding is coming for from World Bank, from uh, the EU, from Gavi Global Fund and others, four countries. There's operational guidance uh, on this. We've now just finished some work on, on guidance on how to maintain essential community-based treatment and outreach services. Those are big, um, uh, important pieces of healthcare delivery around the world. Um, we've also really pushed for obligatory hand hygiene stations in public spaces and given guidance about that. Um, in some countries, you see that really taking off and others, um, uh, like my own in France, I really wish we had some more and, and there's gonna be a push for that as the country starts to open back up after May, May 11th. Uh, next slide. There's some important guidance on um, uh, and, and work that we do on co coordination and convening and, and really trying to manage uh, some of the knowledge work. And I think uh, having this uh, feature with the Patient Safety uh, Movement Foundation has been a core piece of that um, in terms of both gathering information and also getting information out there. Next slide. Um, this is the picture of the, the guidance and the recommendations that are there. There's a set of targeted immediate actions around this and 
really trying to help countries uh, think about six real areas. Uh, uh, next slide. That give them programmatic guidance about how to maintain uh, services. It's really about setting up the governance mechanisms uh, for the response protocols in terms of the services. Identify what are the services you're keeping there. We suggest some, but obviously it's related to the specific context. Um, trying to optimize those service delivery settings. So setting up the triage and the and uh, shifting tasks um, and shifting services as they need to be. Uh, ensuring effective patient flow, uh, and we have guidance on that, and also redistributing health workforce capacity, and then looking at what are the mechanisms to maintain available uh, medic essential medications. The second biggest concern that all of our countries have is on this global supply chain and how the interruptions because of border closures, as well as even within countries, restrictions on travel have meant that essential supplies are in in many parts of the world were difficult to get to the front line already. So now it's even doubly uh, difficult. And some of the focus now on getting uh, PPE and uh, sort of testing and this kind of thing to the front line um, with big uh, planes flying around means that this is something that um, we will have difficulty now making sure uh, that uh, some of the essential medicines can be also br uh, brought along as well. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the hand hygiene recommendations we have already put out there um, in terms of obligatory stations and then um, trying to really improve uh, hand hygiene and, and its approach. And on the next slide, um, I would try to remind people about uh, the 5th of May, which is 5-5, um, uh, five, five, uh, and it's uh, meaning five fingers and um, on your two hands, and that's our official uh, hand hygiene uh, day every year. It's part of our, was our first global patient safety challenge and this is our global day. And this year, uh, well, the focus was already on the year of the nurse and, and the role of nurses and midwives in safe patient care. And some of the messages there you see that's really for everybody. Uh, so I just, that's coming up. Um, and I would really encourage people to get on social media and um, uh, we can, through the foundation, we hope to amplify the, the message on this and DG uh, Pedros will be making some good uh, messages on this as well. Next slide. Um, so the, the couple tools that are out there that help plan some of this uh, issues around task shifting and around um, uh, and around um, essential supplies uh, we've mentioned, uh, and these are the, the items that are there and they're available on the website. Next slide. Um, and just to close with the idea that um, this, it, it's very clear that this isn't just about delivering COVID care. It's about uh, essential services. And it's not just about sort of essential health services and, and the health system and recovering in the health system. It's really about uh, societal recovery. I mean, the idea that, uh, that there is full scientific um, decisions being made around the, the reopening of societies is just not... Um, uh, fully, uh, it's, there's as much science as can be brought there, but there's no decision maker that, that is able to look at science and able to say, okay, now exactly at this moment is the right moment, uh, according to science, to reopen by this amount kind of thing. So this um, uh, framework from the Secretary General that we worked on a lot um, takes the last pillar of WHO's um, response, which is around uh, uh, ensuring essential health services and takes a very health first approach um, and makes it the first pillar of the of, of the UN's roadmap for working with countries on this. But it then looks at jobs, it looks at trade, it looks at a whole range of issues that need to be tackled to really bring back uh, countries. And all of us, I think, anticipate that we will not be going back to what we had before. Actually, I hope we don't. Uh, I, I am now hoping that um, I never have to wonder whether someone's in the office or not about having a meeting anymore, that we just send the link and people can show up virtually. Um, I seriously hope that, that WHO does, uh, you know, maybe not no travel anymore, but at least a, a drastically reduced travel. Um, the air is cleaner over Paris than it's ever been, over Bombay as well, over Delhi rather as well. And the, um, there are many things that'll be different. I think though that one of the issues that I wanna come back to to close and come to some of these questions was this aspect of solidarity. Um, there will, we will not be 
there will be no country that is ready to just be back to the way it was before until all countries have really solved this uh, issue. And there's no country that can solve it for part of its population. If you look at Singapore, and it's a country that I've worked with quite a bit on patient safety issues, actually, um, it has got an excellent healthcare system. It's got great surveillance. It's got a very good public health system. It's got a, a population that, um, how should we put it, in relation to perhaps uh, as an American or as uh, someone living in France, we not so good at following orders sometimes. But to say in Singapore, people are uh, will you know they'll comply with um, with messages from their government. Um, so they cracked down very early, as it were, and and had a, had a great control, and it was a model for the world. But um, there is also a large population that are migrant pop workers that come to work on construction, come to work in restaurants, come to work uh, cleaning, and all sorts of other tasks. And they the virus, because they're outside the formal economy and outside of really formal healthcare systems, it restarted there. And it is now restarted in a huge way in Singapore. So this will happen in literally every single country in the world. Uh, and the, Dr. Chedros likes to say the virus, the virus exploits and shines a light on the cracks, big and small, we have in our societies. And uh, nothing could be more true than that as we head back. I think um, John's point about, uh, you know, the comment on Sweden and its approach shows that, um, how should we put it, that maybe there are fewer cracks in the Swedish society and also the uh, sort of an ability to, it may be related to sort of a trust ability. Um, there's also a uh, good uh, testing strategy there, but I think um, that for all of the countries that are opening back up, some countries never really closed, there definitely will be a rise in cases. There's nothing that has changed between before when we had lots of cases coming, the only thing changed, we closed everything down, made people stay home. Now that we don't, if we start to not have that, for sure we will have cases coming again. So it's a question of watching the rate of increase, where the cases come, and really being able to try and uh, trace uh, uh, the work and people uh, taking a modest approach as they go forward. So um, maybe I'll uh, stop there, and I see there are a few other questions, but maybe Don, I'll just pause and see if how you want to go through some of the questions and see if there are any anything others that you'd like to. Yeah. Add. There's a few questions actually, and so um, you know, and so I have uh, some folks helping me out who are collecting some of the information. Um, so, question was the first question was about the World Health Assembly. Do you have any information on whether or not it'll be postponed this year, or will it be virtual? Yes, um, the the current uh, guidance that we've been given on that is that um, it'll be virtual. That's been the discussion. The exact sort of format is still. Um, uh, being finalized, but uh, the the sort of draft um, um, how should we put it? The draft uh, uh, agenda for it right now is um, uh, looks to set up a proposed set of arrangements that um, has between the 18th and uh, 19th of May there would be a virtual um, meeting uh, in virtual plenary using video conferencing and um, uh, the specifics would be communicated, you know, through the governing bodies and that the agenda would, it would be, you know, the agenda was agreed and at the executive board would be much abridged. It would basically be the opening um, a discussion around COVID uh, and the election of the executive board members. And most of the other decisions, uh, the decisions would be put in an omnibus um, document for silent procedure and that there would be most likely later this year, if possible, um, there would be a special uh, uh, additional World Health Assembly sort of a, that would take up some of the uh, more problematic business. Great, thanks. Uh, another question was regarding um, chronic, use of chronic health care services. Those right now who are chronically ill or maybe um, have a, an acute problem that can wait are avoiding health care because of COVID. Um, so how do you see that impacting serv healthcare services moving forward, especially after we begin lifting restrictions? Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, you know, WHO has tried to be really clear with this sort of essential services work to say that, like, there's a range of essential services that need to keep going and countries need to figure out a way to safely uh, offer them. We've offered some guidance. There's IPC guidance that's um, offered there. So people should not be staying home when they have essential services that are there. Now, 
um, if it's an elective surgery, if it's um, something that can safely wait, there's absolutely no reason then to not to, to wait on that. Um, and also to give a break for, uh, for busy healthcare facilities. But um, definitely you are doing much, much more damage if you stay at home uh, and don't uh, seek care for all sorts of things for chronic uh, conditions, whether it be um, uh, regular checkups for diabetes, or whether it be a care for your asthma, whether it be uh, your cancer treatment. Now, many localities and health, local healthcare providers are struggling to deliver those services. So that's a different matter. Um, in principle, all of that stuff should, sh must, must keep going. In practice, many places are, are really struggling uh, uh, with this. And I think that's um, something that we, we need to do a lot more on in terms of uh, providing, providing those uh, services and figuring out a way to remotely deliver care, to, uh, to make home deliveries, to um, home visits even where they're, where they're possible. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I think home, home care is definitely going to, to be one of the things that we see changing in the future. Uh, you mentioned also that, you know, there's, we're really looking at a new normal here. What do you think that that means for PPE moving forward? You know, we've learned a lot about the need for, um, for certain PPE and aerosolized procedures. Do you see that changing after the COVID pandemic slows down? Um. I think what's fascinating as someone who's a patient say anyway, but we're all patient safety people, but so I don't know if other folks would agree, but I am fascinated with how um, it happened also a little bit with, uh, you know, under SARS, but like how now the topic of infection prevention and control, whereas it used to be, I think we said this earlier, and, um, used to be sort of uh, these the special people that were on you know the seventh floor of your hospital and were kind of the annually retentive people that went around and checked everything all the time and everything had to be just right kind of stuff and were you washing your hands and everyone rolled their eyes at them to now like literally everybody in the community cares about infection prevention and control and so um, I think they're they're obviously there are more effective and really sort of less effective um, kind of security blanket type um, uh, things around PPE I think that in healthcare settings, um, what, what I hope change is the, the guidance from WHO and from most, from CDC, from ECDC has not really changed uh, um, in terms of the basic standard precautions. So standard precautions and um, need to be there. But I think what will change is organizations approach to how you organize for preventing infections. And everything we've ever studied on this shows that um, the way you organize services and the way you kind of follow up and check on, on infection prevention has a much, much bigger impact than whether or not you're wearing a, a particular mask or uh, the, a particular type of, of PPE. But um, so I think that I hope that at least in healthcare settings, every single uh, hospital in the world and every single um, care provider in the world has a designated focal point for IPC who has tools like checklists and, and regular uh, checks on this, and that they follow some of the training that WHO is putting out. We're launching a new uh, app with our, the WHO Academy that's uh, starting just this week. That'll put all of our training on, online for uh, people. And uh, I hope IPC is the number one uh, downloaded uh, training document. Great, well, we'll definitely share it on our website for sure. And then one more question. I know we are a few minutes over, but if you've got time, there was a question related to um, COVID and strokes. We're hearing all kinds of different presentations of COVID. Um, I even heard about COVID toe yesterday for the first time. Can you speak to what you're seeing around the world? Is, is every country experiencing these same odd symptoms from COVID? Yeah, there has been a lot of discussion around these um, uh, around these different uh, symptoms, you know, it, for the most part, um, uh, you know, for a while we were all talking about the um, loss of taste and smell and, you know, other things like that. Um, that has been investigated. Um, it, it's been found to be present for some patients, not sort of in the vast majority and not significantly higher and not really useful as a specific um, kind of symptom. I, and I think it's really coming, it's not to say that, that those don't have merit at all. And I think there's tons we do not know about this disease. That's the whole nature of a novel virus. But um, it's, uh, I, at least our 
feeling is so far is that there hasn't been that kind of um, breakthrough symptom that would allow us uh, additional symptom because actually fever and cough is very unspecific uh, in terms there's lots of stuff that goes with that. But um, so everyone's been looking for what, it, what are some of those little keys that might tell us that, yeah, this is COVID and it's not just some regular flu or not just a, um, a hay fever or something else. Um, and uh, that so far there hasn't been that hasn't been that breakthrough, but for sure we are. It's one of those things we're monitoring all the time, um, and uh, would definitely come back to the group if there's anything that's a uh, super substance on it. On the stroke question, um, I'll have to do a little bit more digging about what's the latest because I haven't followed it and uh, we haven't dug into it in the last uh, couple of days. But um, I'll come back to you Donna, with anything that we find. That would be great. Thanks. Well, I know we are, we are over our time and I really appreciate you joining us today. As always, we have enjoyed speaking with you and learning about what you guys are doing. And, 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 and it's just so, it's so helpful to hear uh, about what's happening across the world. I think that, you know, your, your comment about solidarity is so very important right now. We, we are all dealing with the same thing and it's great to learn from each other. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Donna. And really thanks to the foundation uh, for um, setting aside the time and for folks being online. I really, honestly, if, um, if you didn't have time uh, to, uh, if we didn't come to your specific answer, um, you know, maybe with John and we can work together and uh, come back uh, with some written stuff that you can post on the website um, for anything that, that, that would be useful. Uh, particularly, there's lots of stuff on long-term care, lots of stuff on uh, classifications of mortality and these types of questions that people are wondering about. So I'm happy to happy to spend a little bit more time offline and, and you can share it the next time everyone's together. That would be fabulous. Yes, everybody, please send us your questions. You'll get a survey after this webinar and please let us know if there are any questions that you have. We can post them on our website or send them via email. Great. Well, thank you very much again for your time and we hope to talk to you again in a few weeks. Sounds good, Donna. We'll be back. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.